Hi, welcome to Storytime ASMR. I am Zombie Girl, and today we're going to be reading Chapter 1 of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. It's written by Susanna Clark. Uh, it's one of my favorite books out there. Um, we're reading this today because someone very dear to me is going in for heart surgery. Uh, so Uncle Bill, if you're there, hi. I love you. I hope you're doing okay. Um, can't be there with him today because of COVID, um, but I thought this might be a nice way to get together and share something. I uh, thought that he might particularly like this book. He reminds me of a wise and old magician himself, and I hope you enjoy. So this is ASMR, so I'll be whispering. Uh, it's my very first one ever, so... You know, I'm sure we'll be learning how it works as it, it goes, and uh, if you hear my cats around, you know, I have cats, sorry. So, why don't we just go ahead and get started. So, volume one is called Mr. Norrell. It says here, he hardly ever spoke of magic, and when he did, it was like a history lesson and no one could bear to listen. Chapter 1 The Library at Hertview Autumn 1806 through January 1807 Some years ago, there was in the city of York a society of magicians. They met upon the third Wednesday of every month and read each other long, dull papers on the history of English magic. They were gentlemen magicians, which is to say they had never harmed anyone, nor ever done anyone the slightest bit of good. In fact, to own the truth, not one of these magicians had ever cast the smallest spell, nor by magic cost one leaf to tremble, nor one mote of dust to alter its course, or changed a single hair upon anyone's head. But, with this one minor reservation, they enjoyed a reputation as some of the wisest and most magical gentlemen of Yorkshire. The great magician has said of his profession that its practitioners must pound and rack their brains to make the least learning go in but quarreling always comes very natural to them. The York magicians had proved this truth for a number of years. In the autumn of 1806, they received an addition to the gentleman called John Secundus. At the first meeting that he attended, Mr. Secundus rose and addressed the society. He began by complimenting the gentlemen upon their distinguished history. He listed the many celebrated magicians and historians that at one time or another belonged to the York Society. He hinted that it had been no small inducement to him in coming to York to know of the existence of such a society. Northern magicians, he reminded his audience, had always been better respected than southern ones. Mr. Secunda said that he had studied magic for many years and knew the histories of all, the great magicians of long ago. He read the new publications upon the subject and even made a modest contribution to their number. But recently, he had begun to wonder why the great feats of magic that he had read about remained on the pages of his book and were no longer seen in the streets or written about in newspapers. Mr. Segundus wished to know, he said, why modern magicians were unable to work the magic that they wrote about. In short, he wished to know why there was no more magic done in England. It was the most commonplace question in the world. It was a question which, sooner or later, every child in the kingdom asks his governess, or his schoolmaster, or his parents. 
yet the learned members of the York Society did not at all like hearing it asked, and the reason was this. They were no more able to answer it than anyone else. The president of the York Society, whose name was Dr. Foxcastle, turned to John Secundus and explained that the question was a wrong one. It presupposes that magicians have some sort of duty to do magic, which is clearly nonsense. You would not, I imagine, suggest that it is the task of botanist to devise more flowers, or that astronomers should labor to rearrange the stars. Magicians, Mr. Secundus, study magic, which was done long ago. Why should anyone expect more? An elderly gentleman with faint blue eyes and faintly colored clothes, called either Hart or Hunt, Mr. Secundus, never could quite catch the name, faintly said that it did not matter in the least whether anybody expected it or not. A gentleman could not do magic. Magic was what street sorcerers pretended to do in order to rob children of their pennies. Magic, in the practical sense was much fallen off, it had low connections. It was the bosom companion of unshaven faces, gypsies, housebreakers, the frequenter of dingy rooms with dirty yellow curtains. Oh no, a gentleman could not do magic. A gentleman might study the history of magic. Nothing could be more nobler, but he could not do any. The elderly gentleman looked with faint, fatherly eyes at Mr. Secundus, and said that he hoped Mr. Secundus had not been trying to cast spells. Mr. Secundus blushed. But the famous magician's maxim held true. Two magicians in this case, Dr. Foxcastle and Mr. Hunt or Hart, could not agree without two more thinking the exact opposite. Several of the gentlemen began to discover that they were entirely of Mr. Secundus's opinion, and that no question in all of magical scholarship could be so important as this one. Chief among Mr. Secundus's supporters was a gentleman called Honeyfoot, a pleasant, friendly sort of man of fifty-five, with a red face and gray hair. As the exchanges became more bitter, and Dr. Foxcastle grew in sarcasm towards Mr. Secundus. Mr. Honeyfoot turned to him several times and whispered such comforts as, Do not mind them, sir. I am entirely of your opinion. And, You are quite right, sir. Do not let them sway you. And, You have hit upon it. Indeed, you have, sir. It was the want of the right question which held us back before. Now that you have come, we shall do great things. Such kind words as these did not fail to find a grateful listener in John Secundus, whose shock showed clearly on his face. I fear that I have made myself disagreeable, he whispered to Mr. Honeyfoot. That was not my intention. I had hoped for these gentlemen's good opinion. At first, Mr. Secundus was inclined to be downcast, but a particularly spiteful outburst from Dr. Foxcastle had roused him to a little indignation. And that gentleman, said Dr. Foxcastle, fixing Mr. Secundus with a cold stare, in the unhappy fate of the Society of the Manchester Magicians. I'm sorry, excuse me. Seems determined that we should share in the unhappy fate. The Society of Manchester Magicians. <laughs> Mr. Secundus inclined his head towards Mr. Honeyfoot and said, I had not expected to find the magicians of Yorkshire quite so obstinate. If magic does not have friends in Yorkshire, where may we find them? Mr. Honeyfoot's kindness to Mr. Secundus did not end that evening. He invited Mr. Secundus to his house in High Peter Gate to eat a good dinner in company with Mrs. Honeyfoot and their three pretty daughters.
which Mr. Segundus, who was a single gentleman and not rich, was glad to do. After dinner, Miss Honeyfoot played the pianoforte, and Miss Jane sang in Italian. The next day, Mrs. Honeyfoot told her husband that John Secundus was exactly what a gentleman should be, but she feared he would never profit by it, for it was not in the fashion to be modest and quiet and kind-hearted. The intimacy between the two gentlemen advanced very Soon Mr. Secundus was spending two or three evenings out of every seven at the house in High Peter Gate. Once there was quite a crowd of young people present, which naturally led to dancing. It was all very delightful, but often Mr. Honeyfoot and Mr. Secundus would slip away to discuss the one thing that really interested both of them. Why was there no more magic done in England? But talk as they would, Often till two or three in the morning, they came no nearer to an answer, and perhaps this was not so very remarkable, for all sorts of magicians and antiquarians and scholars had been asking the same question for rather more than two hundred years. Mr. Honeyfoot was a tall, cheerful, smiling gentleman with a great deal of energy, who always liked to be doing or planning something rarely thinking to inquire whether that something were to the purpose. The present task put him very much in mind of the great medieval magicians, who, whenever they had some seemingly impossible problem to solve, would ride away for a year and a day with only a fairy servant or two to guide them, and at the end of this time never failed to find the answer. Mr. Honeyfoot told Mr. Secundus, that in his opinion they could not do better than emulate these great men, some of whom had gone to the most retired parts of England, in Scotland and Ireland, where magic was the strongest, while others had ridden out of this world entirely, and no one nowadays was quite clear about where they had gone or what they had done when they had gone there. Mr. Honeyfoot did not propose in going quite so far, Indeed, he did not wish to go far at all, because it was winter, and the roads were very shocking. Nevertheless, he was strongly persuaded that they should go somewhere and consult someone. He told Mr. Segundus that they thought they were both growing stale, and the advantage of a fresh opinion would be immense. But no destination, no object presented itself. Mr. Honeyfoot was in despair. And then he thought of the other magician. Some years before, the York Society had heard rumors that there was another magician in Yorkshire. This gentleman lived in a very retired part of the country where, it was said, he passed his days and nights studying rare magical texts in his wonderful library. Dr. Foxcastle had found out the other magician's name and where he might be found and written a polite letter inviting the other member, the other magician, to become a member of the York Society. The other magician had written back, expressing his sense of honor done to him and his deep regret. He was quite unable, the long distance between York and Hartview Abbey, the indifferent roads, the work that he could not on any account neglect, etc., etc., the York magicians had all looked over the letters and expressed their doubts that anybody with such small handwriting could ever make a tolerable magician. Then, with some slight regret for the wonderful library that they would never see, they had dismissed the other magician from their thoughts. But Mr. Honeyfoot said to Mr. Secundus that the importance of the question, why was there no more magic done in England, was such that it could be very, very wrong of them to neglect any opening. Who could say? The other magician's opinion might be worth having. So he wrote a letter proposing that he and Mr. Secundus give themselves the satisfaction of waiting on the other magician on the third Tuesday after Christmas at half past two. A reply came very promptly 
Mr. Honeyfoot, with his customary good nature and good fellowship, immediately sent for Mr. Secundus and showed him the letter. The other magician wrote in a small handwriting that he would be very happy in the acquaintance. This was enough. Mr. Honeyfoot was very well pleased and instantly strode off to tell Waters, the coachman, when he would be needed. Mr. Secundus was left alone in the room with the letter in his hand. He read, I am, confess, somewhat at a loss to account for the sudden honor done to me. It is scarcely conceivable that the magicians of York, with all the happiness of each other's society, and the incalculable benefit of each other's wisdom, should feel any necessity to conduct, consult a solitary scholar such as myself. There was an air of subtle sarcasm about the letter. The writer seemed to mock Mr. Honeyfoot with every word. Mr. Secundus was glad to reflect that Mr. Honeyfoot could scarcely have noticed, or he not would have gone to such elated spirits to speak with Waters. It was such a very unfriendly letter that Mr. Secundus found that all his desire to look upon the other magician had quite evaporated. Well, no matter, he thought. I must go, because Mr. Honeyfoot wishes it. And what, after all, is the worst that can happen? We will see him and be disappointed, and that will be the end of it. The day of the visit was preceded by stormy weather. Rain had been long, ragged pools in the bare brown fields. Wet roofs were like cold stone mirrors, and Mr. Honeyfoot's post-chase traveled through a world that seemed to contain a much higher proportion of chill gray sky and a much smaller one of solid, comfortable earth than was usually the case. Ever since the first evening, Mr. Secundus had been intending to ask Mr. Honeyfoot about the Learned Society of Magicians of Manchester, which Dr. Foxcastle had mentioned, and he did so now. It was a society of quite recent foundation, Mr. Honeyfoot said, and its members were clergymen of the poorer sort respectable ex-tradesmen, apothecaries, lawyers, retired mill owners who had got up a little Latin and so forth, such people as might be termed half-gentlemen. I believe Dr. Foxcastle was glad when they disbanded. He does not think that people of that sort have any business becoming magicians. And yet, you know, there were several very clever men among them. They began as you did, with the of bringing back practical magic to the world. They were practical men and wished to apply the principles of reason and science to magic, as they had done to the manufacturing arts. They called it rational thaumaturgy. And when it did not work, they became discouraged. Well, they cannot be blamed for that. But they did let their disillusionment lead them into all sorts of difficulties. They began to think there were, was not now, nor ever had been, any magic in the world. They said that all the magicians were deceivers, or that they themselves had been deceived, and that the Raven King was an invention of the Northern English to keep themselves from the tyranny. Being North Country men themselves, they had some sympathy with that. Oh, their arguments were very ingenious. I forget how they explained fairies. They disbanded, as I told you, and one of them, whose name was Aubrey, I think, meant to write it all and publish it. But when it came to the point, he found that a sort of fixed melancholy had settled in him. He was not able to rouse himself enough to begin. Poor gentleman, said Mr. Segundus. Perhaps it is the age. It is not an age for magic or scholarship, is it, sir? Tradesmen prosper, sailors, politicians, but not magicians. Our time is past. He thought for a moment. Three years ago, he said, I was in London and I met with a street magician, a vagabonding yellow curtain sort of fellow, with a strange disfiguration. The man persuaded me to part with quite a high sum of money, in return for which he promised to tell me a great secret. When I had paid him the money, he told me that one day magic would be restored to England by two magicians. Now, 
I do not at all believe in prophecies, yet it is thinking on what he said that has me determined to discover the truth of our fallen state. Is that not strange? You are entirely right. Prophecies are great nonsense, said Mr. Honeyfoot, laughing. And then, as if struck by a thought, he said, We are two magicians, Honeyfoot and Secundus, he said, trying it out, as if thinking how it would look in the newspapers and history books. Honeyfoot and Secundus, it sounds very well. Mr. Secundus shook his head. The father knew my profession, and it was only to be expected that he should pretend to me that I was one of the two men. But in the end he told me quite plainly that I was not. At first it seemed as if he was not sure of it. There was something about me. He made me write down my name and looked at it for a good long while. I expect he could see there was not much more money to be had out of you, said Mr. Honeyfoot. Hertview Abbey was some fourteen miles northwest of York. The antiquity was all in the name. There had been an abbey, but that was long ago. The present house had been built in the reign of Anne. It was very handsome and square and solid-looking in a fine park, full of closely-looking wet trees, for the day was becoming rather misty. A river called the Hurt ran through the park, and a fine, classical-looking bridge led across it. The other magician, whose name was Nora, was in the hall to receive his guests. He was small, like his handwriting and his voice, when he welcomed them to her view, was rather quiet, as if he was not used to speaking his thoughts out loud. Mr. Honeyfoot, who was a little deaf, did not quite catch what he said. I get old, sir, a common feeling. I hope you will bear with me. Mr. Norrell led his guests to a handsome drawing room with a fine fire burning in the hearth. No candles had been lit. Two fine windows gave plenty of light to see by although it was a grey sort of light and not at all cheerful. Yet the idea of a second fire, or candles burning somewhere in the room, kept occurring to Mr. Segundus, so that he continually turned in his chair and looked about him to discover where they might be. But there never was anything, only perhaps a mirror or an antique clock. Mr. Norrell said that he had read Mr. Segundus' account of the careers of Martin Pales, fairy servant. A credible piece of work, sir, but you left out Master Fleet Fallow Thought, a very minor spirit, certainly, whose usefulness to the great Dr. Pale was questionable. Nevertheless, your history was incomplete without him. There was a pause. A fairy spirit called Fallow Thought, sir, said Mr. Segundus. I, that is, that is to say, I never heard of any such creature in this world or any other. Mr. Norrell smiled for the first time, but it was an inward smile. Of course, he said, I am forgetting. It is all in whole Garth and Pickle's history of their own dealings with Master Fallowthought, which you could scarcely have read, I congratulate you. They were an unsavory pair, more criminal than magical, the less one knows of them, the better. Ah, sir, cried Mr. Honeyfoot, suspecting that Mr. Norrell was speaking of one of his books. We hear marvelous things of your library. All the magicians of Yorkshire fell in great fits of jealousy when they heard the number of books you had got. Indeed, said Mr. Norrell coldly, you surprise me. I had no idea my affairs were so commonly known. I expected as thorough good, he said, thoughtfully, naming a man who sold books and curiosities in Coffee Yard in York. Child or Mass had warned me several times that Thoroughgood is a chatterer. Mr. Honeyfoot did not quite understand this. If he had had such quantities of magical books, he would have loved to have talked about them, be complimented on them, and have them admired. And he could not believe that Mr. Norrell was not of the same. Meaning, therefore, to be kind and to set Mr. Norrell at his ease, for he had taken it into his head that the gentleman was shy. He persisted. Might I be permitted to express a wish, sir, that we might see your wonderful library? Mr. Secundus was certain that Nora would refuse, but instead Nora regarded them steadily for some moments. He had small blue eyes, 
that seemed to peep out at them from some secret place inside of himself. He granted Mr. Norrell, or Mr. Honeyfoot's request. Mr. Honeyfoot was all gratitude, happy in the belief that he had pleased Mr. Norrell as much as himself. Mr. Norrell led the other two gentlemen along a passage. Very ordinary passage, thought Mr. Secundus, paneled and floored with well-polished oak and smelling of beeswax. Then there was a staircase, or perhaps only three or four steps, and then another passage where the cold air was somewhat deeper and the floor was good York stone. All entirely unremarkable unless the second passage had come before the staircase or the steps? Or had there in truth been a staircase at all? Mr. Secundus was one of those happy gentlemen who can always say whether they face north or south, east or west. It was not a talent he took any particular pride in. It was as natural to him as knowing that his head still stood upon his shoulders. But in Mr. Norrell's house, this gift deserted him. He could never afterwards picture the sequence of passageways and rooms through which they had passed, nor quite decide how long they had taken to reach the library. All he could not tell the direction, it seemed to him that Mr. Norrell had discovered some fifth point on the compass, not east, nor south, nor west, nor north, but somewhere quite different, and this was the direction in which he led them. Mr. Honeyfoot, on the other hand, did not appear to notice anything odd. The library was perhaps a little smaller than the drawing room that they had just quitted. There was a noble fire in the hearth, and all was comfort and quiet, yet once again the light within the room did not seem to accord with the three tall twelve-paned windows, so that once again Mr. Segundus was made uncomfortable by a persistent feeling that there ought to have been other candles in the room, other windows, or another fire to account for the light. What windows there were looked out upon a wide expanse of dusky English rain, so that Mr. Secundus could not make out the view nor guess where in the house they stood. The room was not empty. There was a man sitting at a table who rose as they entered, and whom Mr. Norrell briefly declared declared to be child or mass, his man of business. Mr. Honeyfoot and Mr. Segundus, being magicians themselves, had not needed to be told that the library at Hertview Abbey was dearer to its possessor than all its other riches, and they were not surprised to discover that Mr. Norrell had constructed a beautiful jewel box to house his heart's treasure. The bookcases which lined the walls of the room were built of English woods and resembled Gothic arches laden with carvings. There were carvings of leaves, dried and twisted leaves, as if the season the artist had intended to represent were autumn, carvings of intertwining roots, branches, carvings of berries and ivy, all wonderfully done. But the wonder of the bookcases was nothing to the wonder of the books first thing a student of magic learns is that there are books about magic and books of magic. The second thing he learns is that a perfectly respectful example of the former may be had for two or three guineas and a good bookseller, and that the value of the latter is above rubies. The collection of the York Society was reckoned very fine, almost remarkable. Among its many volumes were five works written between 1550 and 1700, and which might reasonably be claimed as books of magic, though one was no more than a couple of ragged pages. Books of magic are rare, and neither Mr. Secundus nor Mr. Honeyfoot had ever seen more than two or three in a private library. At Hartfield, all the walls were lined with bookshelves, and all the shelves were filled with books. And all the books were all, or almost all, old books, books of magic. Oh, to be sure, many had clean modern bindings, but clearly these were volumes which Mr. Norrell had rebound. He favored it seemed plain calf, with the title stamped in neat silver capitals, but many had bindings that were old, 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 with crumbling spines and corners. 
Mr. Secundus glanced at the spines of the books on a nearby shelf. The first title he read was How to Put Questions to the Dark and Understand Its Answers. A foolish work, said Mr. Norrell. Mr. Secundus started. He had not known his host was so close by. Mr. Norrell continued. I would advise you not to waste a moment's thought upon it. So Mr. Secundus looked at the next book, which was Balassus' Instructions. You know Balassus, I dare say, asked Mr. Norrell. Only by reputation, sir, said Mr. Secundus. I have often heard that he held the key to a good many things, but I have also heard, indeed all the authorities agree, that every copy of the instructions was destroyed long ago. Yet now here it is. Why, sir, it is extraordinary. It is wonderful. You expect a great deal out of Blasses, remarked Norrell, and once upon a time I was entirely of your mind. I remember that for many months I devoted eight hours out of every twenty-four to the studying of his work, a compliment I may say that I have never paid any other author, but ultimately he is disappointing. He is mystical where he ought to be intelligible, and intelligible where he ought to be obscure. There are some things which have no business being put into books for all the world to read. For myself, I no longer have any great opinion of Blasis. Here is a book I have never even heard of, sir, said Mr. Secundus. The Excellences of Christo Judaic Magic. What can you tell me of this? Ha! cried Mr. Norrell. It dates back from the seventeenth century, but I have no great opinion of it. Its author was a liar, a drunkard, an adulterer, and a rogue. I am glad he has been so completely forgotten. It seemed that it was not only live magicians which Mr. Norrell despised. He had taken the measure of all the dead ones, too, and found them lacking. Mr. Honeyfoot, meanwhile, his hands in the air like a Methodist praising God, was walking rapidly from bookcase to bookcase. He could scarcely stop long enough to read the title of one book before his eye was caught by another on the other side of the room. Oh, Mr. Norrell, he cried. Such a quantity of books, surely we shall find all the answers to our questions here. I doubt it, sir, was Mr. Norrell's dry reply. The man of business gave a short laugh, laughter which was clearly directed at Mr. Honeyfoot, yet Mr. Norrell did not reprimand him either by look or word, and Mr. Secundus wondered what sort of business it could be that Mr. Norrell entrusted to this person, with as long hair as ragged as rain, and as black as thunder, he would have looked quite at home upon a windswept moor, or lurking in some pitch-black alleyway, or perhaps in a novel by Mrs. Radcliffe. Mr. Secundus took down the instructions of Jackie's Balassus, and, despite Mr. Norrell's poor opinion of it, instantly hit upon two extraordinary passages. Then, conscious of the time passing, of the queer dark eye of the man of business upon him, he opened the excellences of Christian Judaic magic. This was not, as he had supposed, a printed book, but a manuscript scribbled down very hurriedly upon the backs of all kinds of bits of paper, most of them old alehouse bills. Here Mr. Segundus read of wonderful adventures. The seventeenth-century magician had used his scanty magic to battle against the great and powerful enemies battles which no human magician ought to have even attempted. He had scribbled down the history of his patchwork victories just as those enemies were closing around him. The author had known very well that, as he wrote, time was running out for him, and death was the best that he could hope for. The room was becoming darker, and the antique scrawl was growing dim on the page. Two footmen came into the room and watched by the business-like man of business. Lit candles, drew window curtains, and heaped fresh coals upon the fire. Mr. Secundus thought that it was best to remind Mr. Honeyfoot they had not yet explained to Mr. Norrell the reason for their visit. As they were leaving the library, Mr. Secundus noticed something he thought odd. A chair was drawn up to the fire, and by the chair stood a little table. Upon the table lay the boards and leather bindings of a very old a pair of scissors and strong, cool-looking knife, such as a gardener might use for pruning. 
but the pages of the book were nowhere to be seen. Perhaps, thought Mr. Secundus, he had sent it away to be bound anew. Yet the old binding is still looks strong. And why should Mr. Norrell trouble himself to remove the pages and risk damaging them? A skilled bookbinder was the proper person to do such a work. When they were seated in the drawing-room again, Mr. Honeyfoot addressed Mr. Norrell. Whatever I have seen here today convinces me that you are the best person to help us. Mr. Segundus and I are of the opinion that modern magicians are on the wrong path. They waste their energies upon trifles. Do you not agree, sir? Oh, certainly, said Mr. Norrell. Our question, continued Mr. Honeyfoot, is why magic has fallen from its once great state in our great nation. Our question is, sir, why is no more magic done in England? Mr. Norrell's small blue eyes grew harder and brighter, and his lips tightened as if he were seeking to suppress a great and secret delight within him. It was as if thought Mr. Secundus, that he had waited a long time for someone to ask him this question, and had had his answer ready for years. Mr. Norrell said, I cannot help you with your question. It is a wrong question, sir. Magic is not ended in England. I, myself, am quite a tolerable, practical magician. That's it for chapter one of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell check back tomorrow for chapter two. Um, I have to record this at like two, two in the morning. Let's see what time it is. Yeah, it's, it's almost three o'clock in the morning. Um, so yeah, but I'm happy to do it. Uncle Bill, if you're still listening, I love you and, uh, hope you're doing well. And yes, please like, subscribe, share, you're not Uncle Bill and somehow I've stumbled onto this. Um, yeah, thank you so much and hope you enjoy. Bye-bye.